Why? All right, good evening, everyone. I am glad to be here once again. Uh, greetings, Richly Redeem. What's up, Nate? Michelle, how are you doing? All right. And as people are coming in, you guys can share this. We got a really great discussion tonight as you're coming in. Make sure if you haven't already, please subscribe to the channel. Uh, our vision here, our purpose here is to make sure that everybody enters into a confirmed, confident, and eternal relationship with the source of all life and purpose. With that being said, I am very happy uh, to have my guest, Dr. Eric Hedin. Um, he is here, and we're going to get into the story and, and, and um, other things that he actually does prior to the story. <laughs> uh, that was an unfortunate situation. But I also want to let everybody know, go get the book, Canceled Science, um, What Some Atheists Don't Want You to See. I uh, know, provocative title. But uh, I've done a lot of uh, videos and, and talks about cancel culture in general and how it it won't work in a, in a sociological sense because we all end up canceling each other. But what's very troubling or more, more troubling, I think, is that in places where um, academic rigor should be uh, celebrated and typically is, I think, uh, to see certain ideas not given access or the same um, level of veracity, validity, um, or, or assuming that young people, when I say young people, I'm talking about college students, that they can't discern for themselves what's true and, and, and thinking that they need to be protected or guarded from every idea. That's kind of the troubling trend that I've seen and we see in society. And my guest has uh, some very pertinent firsthand experience uh, with these matters. So first, uh, Dr. Uh, Eric, can you just introduce yourself? Tell us about your field of study and everything you do. Okay, well, thank you, Alex. It's a great uh, privilege, pleasure to be on your show this evening. And um, my background is in physics. I've uh, primarily taught physics uh, at a few different universities, both in Indiana and uh, Southern California. I was at Biola University there in Orange County for a few years. And uh, before that, at uh, Ball State University in Indiana, where most of this story about uh, canceled science takes place. Mm -hmm. And I've uh, also taught at Taylor University in Indiana. And my background in... Uh, oh, okay. I didn't know that. I spoke there before. Oh, at Taylor? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great place. Yeah. Um, so also my experimental physics background uh, started off in nuclear fusion energy research. Uh, or sometimes known as plasma physics. And uh, that took me then to Stockholm, Sweden for a few years, uh, where I worked at a technical university there, the Royal Institute of Technology, and um, had the privilege of meeting a lot of great people. Um, but I felt like I really wanted to focus my career on teaching, uh, not just uh, doing research in the lab, but uh, actually making a contribution to the lives of young people. Uh, so I, that's what transitioned me into uh, teaching, and I ended up in Indiana. Great. No, I appreciate you sharing that. And um, yeah, so speaking of Indiana, let's let's start there. Um, so can you just, uh, you know, your story is unique, but like I said, unfortunately, it's becoming increasingly less unique, I guess is a way to say it. Can you kind of run us through the situation that happened while you were teaching at Ball State, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. Sure, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I started at Ball State University in the early 2000s and joined the uh, Department of Physics and Astronomy, and um, I taught a lot of astronomy courses at that time, uh, one or two per semester uh, to hundreds and hundreds of students. And um, one of the things that you mentioned, Alex, in your introduction is the idea that uh, purpose and the meaning of our life is, is a really important question. And one of the astronomy books I taught out of had this question, 
kind of phrased in their introduction saying that the study of astronomy could help us to understand the meaning of our existence. And I thought, well, this is an interesting question. I suppose they meant just sort of our place in the cosmos, but I wanted to ask the students what they thought the meaning of their existence was just to kind of build a bridge of uh, connection with them. And so I would take their responses and look at them and kind of give them some feedback the next class day. Um, and it, it was really poignant that there were some really um, touching answers that uh, showed that students were very much interested in the whole idea of purpose in life. Some were concerned they didn't know what it was. Um, some unfortunately thought there was no purpose. Um, some even told me they came to that conclusion after learning about the, the theory of evolution that sort of uh, undermined their idea of having any purpose. Um, others knew that they were grounded in a purpose that was founded in the word of God and the Bible. Mm. But um, I decided that asking big questions was really a good idea, a good way to make a connection with students. And I, I kind of made a habit of that in my classes and uh, collated a just like I said, hundreds of responses over the years. And it told me that students are interested in big questions. And a lot of them have to do with the meaning of life and our place in the universe. And um, even whether or not there is life after death um, and if there's a heaven, how do I get there and all things like this. But um, I eventually put together a course at Ball State that I proposed to be taught in the Honors College. And it was called the Boundaries of Science. Because one of the questions I asked students was, is science able to explain everything? Right. Are there some things that maybe just can't be explained by a mathematical formula of science? And some students were convinced science was going to win the day. Yeah. Others thought, no way, uh, science will never explain my girlfriend or, or <laughs> the true love or something like that. Um, and uh, and I, I really built the course around the concept that although science can teach us a lot and has done a great job of understanding the universe. I mean, I'm a physicist by training and, uh, you know, infusion energy. So, you know, we can develop energy by science. We, all our technology, the laptop and the internet and everything is a result of scientific uh, discoveries. But in addressing certain questions of origins, I feel like science doesn't really have the full answer, in particular, the origin of the universe, the origin of life, the origin of our consciousness, uh, the origin of maybe what we would call the human soul or spirit. Yeah. And um, so there are some areas of what we see in nature that I don't expect to be fully explained by science. So anyway, I taught this course for about six years at Ball State. It was always very popular within the Honors College. And um, part of the goal of Honors College courses was to, in fact, investigate the implications of knowledge, not just um, mm. knowledge for its own sake. And so it was a discussion-based course. Um, it was intended that students should investigate the implications of the scientific uh, theories such as the Big Bang Theory for the origin of the universe or um, you know, information theory, um, anything having to do with uh, what we've discovered in biology and the information in the cell. And even things like um, the mind-brain um, kind of duality. Um, so there were a lot of big questions, but mm -hmm. this was all going well until you want me to get into the conflict here? Let's go. Let's go. <laughs> uh, you mentioned, you know, kind of a cancel culture, how that's become more popular. Well, in 2013, I uh, was the target of a, uh, a very focused effort to cancel my particular course for the very reason that just a few people uh, found it to be objectionable. These were militant atheists, outspoken atheists. And uh, so... You know, they have their own right to an opinion, but to try to force their opinion on others maybe is uh, stretching beyond the bounds of uh, civility. Yeah. And um, so 
the university was actually threatened by a group called the Freedom From Religion Foundation, which uh, seeks to eradicate religion from the public square mm-hmm. in America. And the university was threatened with a, basically being sued unless they canceled my course because their argument was that I was violating the First Amendment by uh, teaching religion in a public science class. So teaching religion was the first issue. I mean, we could kind of ask the the basic question, does discussing scientific evidence that might conflict with naturalism equate with teaching religion in a science Mm. course? And um, just talking about evidence and what it might imply, does that mean that you are actually starting a church and preaching? You know, I... I could hardly believe some of the accusations uh, yeah. coming from various atheists uh, were so misinformed. Um, you know, like I was pushing Jesus down students' throats, and it's like, mm, I, I don't really feel like that's my style. <laughs> it doesn't <Moreover>, over. <laughs> if students had any complaint about the course, it was that there was just uh, too much science that, that kind of overflows easily from my cup as a uh, physicist. But, um, yeah. Well, um, yeah, I thank you for the background and, and, you know, I'm sorry that that happened to you. Uh, I'm glad you landed well, but, you know, that still doesn't excuse what happened. So mm-hmm. let me just ask, because um, the course sounds like something I would love to have t- been able to take. So <laughs> yeah. um, it sounds really interesting. But so in one way, you know, intelligent design uh, opponents would have to know enough of the arguments to be able to say you're teaching religion, even though intelligent design is not the same thing as teaching religion. Cause I know some intelligent design, actually some people even with the discovery Institute who mm-hmm. aren't Christian necessarily, but they just know mm-hmm. Darwinism's wrong. wrong. Um, so the, can you also, I mean, I don't know if this is, is um, where we, where, where you want to go, where we should go. But there was, there's a lot of talk recently, probably since I think 2015, 16, maybe even before that, I'm sure before that, amongst scientists who do affirm Darwinism of them getting together to try to find another theory. Cause that one, as you guys learn more, it doesn't seem to pan out as well. And they, I think at the Royal Society in England, they met, was it 2016? And they were kind of, it was a closed door meeting to try to come up with a different uh, alternative mm-hmm. theory to theism, but also not Darwinism. Can you unpack that a little bit? I could understand perhaps the rationale for wanting to do that if if they are honest and able to face the scientific evidence that is mounting against the validity of, say, random mutations being able to um, explain every living thing in right. our Earth. Um, and yet they perhaps don't want to just allow a religious viewpoint such as God created life to be the only answer. Um, so I don't know any details about what conclusions uh, such a group might have um, come to. Mm-hmm. I really haven't heard anything specific on that. Just that I could I could understand that anyone who is fairly open-minded and aware of the trends and the discussions that are going on and even in the published literature may realize that, yeah, if we don't want to acknowledge God, we may need a different approach <laughs> to explain things than just Darwinism. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, in our, in this class that I taught really didn't um, discuss that so much. It, um, it wasn't so much uh, public at the time, you know, it was pre 2013 when gotcha. class. Okay, so let's uh, kind of get back to the story. So it was a uh, Dr. Jerry Co- Coyne. Is that the right name? Yes, he was the sort of antagonist that uh, first uh, began to press the case against me. Mm-hmm. Um, somehow he had gotten a hold of our course syllabus. <clears throat> and how? Because he's in Atlanta. He's somewhere not even near. Well, I think he's in Chicago, but um, okay. um, he is... Uh, 
yeah, nobody knows. At least uh, nobody that I am aware of uh, has told me how that happened. Um, so the the issue was he was reading what was on the syllabus and making some assumptions and mm. uh, having never actually seen anything of what I was teaching. Gotcha. And uh, yeah, because he called so, it under the guise of science, right? Yeah, saying I was trying to teach religion under the guise of science and maybe to him or others in that kind of a worldview of atheism, perhaps anything that threatens to kind of break out of the box of purely naturalism is equated with religion. Yeah. And um, in some ways, you know, what is there besides naturalism? Well, it would have to be something supernatural or metaphysical, you know, out and beyond. And uh, so perhaps under some definitions that could be religion, but my point is let's follow the evidence where it leads. And if the evidence from nature points to something metaphysical as the source of life in the universe, then it's our um, kind of responsibility as scientists even in, even if you're not a scientist, that's our responsibility to go with what uh, the evidence is leading us to. Uh, it's kind of a connection between truth and reality, I feel. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> yeah. um, well, so let's get into some of that evidence. And um, definitely, I, I, for those who are tuning in a little bit late, um, I want to encourage you to go get the book Canceled Science. You're going to learn not just about the situation that happened with, um, with Dr. Hedin at, at Ball State, but also about the evidence itself uh, from a physicist. So some of it might get a little technical, but it's, it, the book is very accessible and, and you explain the hard stuff very well. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I yeah. appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, it's really my goal in writing the book to uh, provide that evidence, um, partially just to express the wonder and the beauty and the um, marvel, the, the complexity of all the natural phenomenon that we find, whether it's uh, down in the cores of stars as they are producing light and energy, or whether it's in um, side of a living cell, uh, just to point people to that uh, kind of the marvel of what exists and to explain a little bit of the physics behind it that I think um, provides evidence of fine tuning, which is always evidence for a creator and uh, something that is more than just random origins. Mm -hmm. So, well, yeah, the, um, so the, kind of the first question, as we unpack some of this evidence, what in your estimation is, or, or why in your estimation is the fine tuning of the universe such a compelling piece of evidence for a cosmic designer? Uh, that's the first question. And I, I was reading some of um, Dr. Um, Coyne's uh, rebukes against you, I guess, online. Okay. Yesterday. And, you know, ironically, you know, Paul Davies and others think this is compelling, even if they're not going from atheism to Christian. Mm -hmm. But he even tried to downplay what most honest um, scientists, for sure, would say this is pretty compelling. I, I think anybody in your profession, pretty, I mean, even if they're not a Christian, they'll say, you know, this is this is a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And, and he, he seemed to downplay it. And I was like, okay, you're, I think you're going a little bit too far now. But so in your estimation, why is it, why is the fine tuning such a compelling, compelling piece of evidence? And uh, well, let's start there. Okay. That's, that's a fair question. Um, first of all, I think that there's pretty good agreement among scientists that uh, the values of the physical parameters of our universe and, and that phrase physical parameters means things like the speed of light, uh, the value of that, the, the, uh, particular masses of the electrons and the protons or exactly what is the strength of the different forces like gravity or the electric force. And um, these all seem to be within, they have to be within very narrow ranges in order for uh, the universe to take on conditions that would allow life to exist. And I, I mean, extremely narrow ranges if you put them all together. Right. And so it's pretty much in agreement among scientists that this fine tuning exists. The interpretation of that is where people could differ in their understanding. Um, I think that some have dismissed it uh, saying, 
if the conditions of nature were not fine-tuned to support life, then life wouldn't exist and we wouldn't be here to think about it. So it's kind of like to them, uh, a no-brainer that it, it has to be that way and there's nothing interesting. Yeah. But actually there is because yes. they're right in that the conditions of nature need to be such that life could exist for us to be here tonight, for example, having a conversation. But what doesn't have to be for us to exist is that the parameters of nature have to be so knife edge finely tuned so that if certain parameters were varied by just the smallest uh, micro degree, it would be impossible for life to exist. Mm -hmm. There could be, in fact, it's almost, you could say more reasonable to assume that a universe might have parameters um, allowing life to exist that are very broadly uh, kind of tuned so that if you varied parameters, you know, factor of 10 in either, either direction or more, it, it just wouldn't really affect anything. Life would still exist. That is certainly a possibility in a physical universe um, as far as we would know, and perhaps even more likely. The extreme fine tuning where it looks like if you just, you know, nudged it slightly in any direction, everything would fall apart. That tells us that, wow, there's something special going on here and it begs a question of why. And um, I think why is always a good question. I loved it when my students asked why. In fact, I would instruct them at the start of class. If I ever say anything um, in just teaching astronomy, for example, and you don't understand it or you think it's off base or unexplained, just say why <laughs> or, or why is this? And so the universe begs this question. It's yeah. showing us a peculiarity, something remarkable. Why is it like that? And I'd, I'd say that because it's so well set up for us to exist, that perhaps the best explanation is that someone intended for us to exist, who wanted us to notice how exquisitely perfect the universe is and how difficult it really was to set it up. And you know, how easily it could have gone wrong. So it, it right. speaks of an intelligent designer, not just a random uh, design, if you might say that. Yeah, and that's very important because we're talking about a very specific type of being or designer um, mm -hmm. as Christian Theus. And so, you know, I, I think um, there there's some specificities that people, general public is, is aware of, but some of the stuff, mm -hmm that you were writing about, like the decay processes of the elements down to the magnetic field and the iron core are like, no, nope, I'm not thinking about that. Most people aren't, but that all matters as far as our, uh, as far as this planet being habitable, especially for homo sapiens. So mm -hmm. you know, can you talk a little bit about that? And actually I want to put a quote from the book that you said, uh, let me see if I can find it. Okay. Yeah, you said from both uh, scientific and theological considerations. Is that the right one? Yeah. Um, then the age of the universe and the timing of the origins of the earth and life are all consistent with the concept of a cosmic designer with a keen interest in human beings. Um, I, I knew you and I. We're, we're linked in some way because I the why question. So my, my channel is obviously called Relentless Pursuit of Purpose. And the purpose goes back to finding your why or understanding why. Why, mm -hmm. why a lot of different levels. But uh, John, I believe John Lennox said one time that some people think that because we can explain the mechanism that we can eliminate the agency, that that because you know how it works means that you that there was no one who started it to work that way. Mm -hmm. And that's, right. a false, that's a false. Um, conclusion even if you think about a car you know saying i know how a car works doesn't mean henry ford never existed uh, exactly so it, there's nothing wrong and, I, and you know we think about all the science most of if not all of the major scientists were christians and that is why they, from their own words they were able to do science you know so i think mm -hmm. some people now today Think of the, you know, accuse us of God of the gaps and all that. And it, that's not, I think science of the gaps is a better term, but <laughs> um, 
when, when they don't know, they say, well, science is working on it. Okay, great. Well, <laughs> let me know when you figure that one out. But mm -hmm. like I said, you're looking at, okay, the, the core of the earth and how these elements decay. And this means that, and that, and these all connect to all those other constants that most of us, our brain would hurt thinking about, um, like you said, on this knife edge, mm -hmm. but it, if it wasn't, we wouldn't be here. And so can you talk about um, this, the quote that's on the screen, but also just uh, some of these, these lesser known um, necessary conditions in order for life to be inhabitable here? Well, certainly, I think one of the ones that you're um, referring to um, is you mentioned the core of the earth yeah. and uh, radioactive decay of elements. And uh, maybe not everyone realizes that the core of our earth is actually as hot as the surface of the sun. Yeah, you know, so, so if you went down in a mine roughly 4,000 miles straight down, you would enter a zone that is as hot as the surface of the sun near the core of the earth. And the only reason it could still be that hot and um, continuously generate that heat is if there's a heat source and it uh, would come from the decay of radioactive elements so they emit energy as they decay and that can over kind of the uh, the net effect is to keep the core of the earth hot and that first of all why is that important and and does that show any fine tuning or any design and i would say it does and um, the reason is that the heat in the core of the earth is what drives what we call plate tectonics up on the crust of the earth. The movement of the crustal plates um, is essential for life. And there's a, a few reasons. One of them is that it just um, is a major factor in climate control, which is on everybody's uh, radar is an interesting topic these days. Mm -hmm. But there's a feedback mechanism that I believe God has built into this planet that involves the movement of the crustal plates and it allows sort of a recycling of carbon dioxide that had been in the atmosphere, been kind of brought out of the atmosphere by rainwater, washed into the oceans, and then settled into the ocean floor where it would just build up and you would have a progressive removal of CO2 out of the atmosphere, which would actually lower the temperature too much. However, plate tectonics driven by that heat in the core, by the decay of those radioactive elements, causes the plates to move. And um, as they do, the ocean floor plates uh, shift underneath the continental plates in a process called subduction. And as they do, they sink down deeper below the crust and that heats them up and it then releases the CO2 that was kind of uh, archived or buried in the sediments on the ocean floor. And they then are released back to the atmosphere through volcanic action and like eruptions of Mount St. Helens or something like that, which happened in 1980. Uh, I'm from Washington state originally. So yeah. that, uh, that was an event that caught everyone's attention, but the net process is sort of a feedback mechanism that helps to keep the Earth's temperature um, in a safe, moderate range throughout its history. And there are other feedback mechanisms as well, but this uh, CO2 recycling that involves uh, all these steps that I mentioned is, is seriously important. Wow, it's, a, it's, <laughs> it's amazing. And, I, and for me, um, when I hear that or any anything on that level, I, I I think I think I'm having the appropriate response, which is just awe, which which I, for me it's always been weird because I well if you don't believe in God you don't believe in God, but for me the more I learn about what you're talking about and different scientific evidences, there's a benefit of I get to experience greater wonder and greater awe and greater yes. appreciation for mm -hmm. God. So, I, I think, yeah, you know, I think some people think that, oh, no, if God gets in the picture, then all the fun is gone. I, it's not that way for me. 
Yeah. Well, I've had it the opposite way for me. People will think that it's it must be hard for you as a physicist to be a Christian. <laughs> and and I, I just think, no, actually, I feel like I have the privileged position of being able to uh, know and understand, be exposed to so much more detailed evidence for God from scientific discoveries in nature, you know, that say the average person might read about uh, in, a, in a book somewhere. But, you know, it's just part of my wheelhouse as a physicist to learn these things. And the more I study in nature, the more examples of evidence for a designer I find. And so I think it's actually uh, easier to be a Christian and a physicist. Amen. Well, that is encouraging to hear. <laughs> um, okay, so so um, probably the middle section of the book um, regarding the evidence is dealing with stars, and stars are obviously huge um, for us, for planets, for where elements come, came. From. Like all, they they play a big role, and so um, uh, you wrote you wrote much about the lives of the stars. Can you explain in layman's terms? how the how the universe obtained carbon obviously were ca carbon-based life forms and in addition well let's start there because I, I think when i was reading the book i was like man we everyone knows carbon everyone's heard of carbon we've seen carbon atoms in our in our classrooms we know we are composed of it but from what i learned from you and other physicists the creation of carbon was i mean unlikely is, to, is, is an understatement but especially in the quantities that we have it, right? Yes. And just a couple key points to emphasize that you mentioned. Um, carbon is the essential element for life. I mean, there are others, of course, but carbon-based molecules are what all living things are based on. And um, that's what we call organic chemistry, uh, which is in living things that is based on carbon-based molecules. And carbon has the unique properties of being able to form um, multiple bonds and to form large uh, molecules. Um, and there's really no other molecule that um, could take its place in the periodic table. Silicon might be the closest, but uh, it, it's a poor second. And so physicists, have been very interested over the years in how did carbon form in this universe. Now, you may know if you've taken an astronomy course um, that when the universe first began, the only two elements for a long time were hydrogen and helium and, right. and trace amounts of lithium, let's say, but nothing else, no carbon. Mm -hmm. So how did carbon form? And the basic process is that deep down in the cores of stars like our sun, there is this energy production going on. And I think everyone would agree on that. Stars yeah. produce energy. I mean, thank God for that. And, and it's a little dim these days, you know, uh, in Chicago or Indiana, it's kind of been chilly. So we think, you know, where's that sunshine? But um, <laughs> it's uh, a remarkable process of energy production based on nuclear fusion, which was what I studied in uh, my graduate degree for my mm. doctorate. Um, we were trying to find a process that could allow fusion energy production uh, in a controlled way on Earth, but stars produce it uh, almost effortlessly if certain conditions are met. It has to be of a certain mass, so there's enough gravity to compress the core of the star, enough to get it hot enough and dense enough for fusion energy to occur. Now, this process takes light elements, starting with hydrogen, and fuses them together. And if you fuse four hydrogen nuclei, which are simply protons together, you get a helium nucleus. And you might think, well, so what? How does that produce energy? Well, it turns out that in the process, a little bit of the mass of the four protons disappeared, and it became energy using Einstein's famous equation, the one physics equation I think everyone might know, <laughs> E equals mc squared. Right. And so the m is the missing mass that uh, got converted to E, the energy. And that's essentially how our sun produces energy, is production of helium from hydrogen, and it's uh, converting mass to energy. Um, 
Well, so anyway, you can tell I get all excited about this and it's just a fascinating process. But back to carbon. Carbon is heavier than helium. It's uh, essentially you would have to fuse three helium nuclei together to make one carbon nucleus. And you might think, well, okay, let's take this in steps. First, take two heliums and fuse them together. And then once that's there and stable, then stick another helium on and you'll get carbon. The only trouble is, and this is one of those places where I think God shows us some fine tuning involved. If you take the first step in this proposed method of making carbon and put two heliums together, you get um, a beryllium nucleus that is entirely unstable. It simply falls apart again almost immediately. Mm. And so it's like a missing rung in the ladder of building heavier and heavier elements. Mm. And so it was thought when scientists were first studying this that, um, okay, this might block the formation of carbon, but then obviously we have carbon, so there must be a way for it to work. And a, uh, an astronomer named uh, Fred Hoyle predicted that there would be what's called a nuclear resonance, or a couple of them, within carbon that would allow the production of carbon by the joining of three hel heliums together kind of before the in-between step fell apart. I don't want to go too much in detail. <laughs> but suffice it to say, the predicted nuclear resonances were found in carbon, and it exactly allowed enough carbon to be formed by the nuclear fusion process in stars. And um, then there's kind of a little bit of a, you might call it anti-resonance for the next step, because the next step in fuse, fusing would be to add another helium to carbon, and that would make oxygen, which is also needed for life. But if you use up all your carbon in the process, then that's a problem. Hmm. So there's sort of a, a block or an obstacle to prevent all the carbon from so quickly being converted to oxygen. So these um, processes were so convincing that, that Hoyle, who despite a reputation for religious skepticism, as I say in my book, he was so impressed with all this that he says, I do not believe that any scientist who examined the evidence would fail to draw the inference that the laws of nuclear physics have been deliberately designed with regard to the consequences they produce inside the stars. Yeah. And that's a pretty good statement coming from an agnostic astrophysicist who is a uh, a bit grumpy about Christianity. You know, the, the evidence convinced him that there must be something going on. And I, I am so impressed with that as well. I, I am as well. And, and the other one I think about in a different um, field of study is, is um, oh, no, now I'm drawing a blank. Um, uh, that most famous philosopher of the 20th century, he used to Debate. Is it uh, after Hume? Anthony Flew. Sorry. Okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. An yeah. atheistic philosopher at the time. At the time, and then he looked at DNA. And he was like, "This can't be accidental." Uh, and he, he, I don't think he went all the way to Christianity, but he at least went to deism or theism. Yes. Uh, and I, and I, once again, I I respect people who who hey. I, I don't believe this, but once they see more evidence, they're willing to go where the evidence leads. And we all have our journeys, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we have to submit to those journeys. So yeah. I want to, um, cause you, well, I'm gonna pull something up, but before I do that, can you also touch on, I say touch on, cause this is like a whole science course in and of itself, <laughs> but the role of gravity, um, gas clouds, centrifugal force, all of these things, how they combine to create the planet that we live in. I, I think um, for for those that semi are familiar with all these different issues, Stephen Hawking's uh, um, place where he kind of zeroed in was gravity, right? I mean, I know he had other other things composed in his theories, but for, he he kind of thought the the linchpin was gravity to a certain extent, and. Um, I didn't finish that long, thick book, the last one, but I've heard other atheists who did. And they said at the, by the end of the book, they were like, what did I just read? Because mm -hmm. it's a lot of information, but it, 
from what I've heard, he doesn't land the plane and he's brilliant. So I'm obviously not taking anything away from him. But I think what some people miss is what is being sacrificed when you remove a designer or God from the equation. You you don't answer more questions. You raise more questions. You know, all those my questions that you that you brought up. And so I want to show this quote that you um, I believe this was from an interview you did, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but you said that the level of biological information that is within the cell far exceeds what can be attained by any natural process we can think of. And actually, there are laws of physics that claim that natural processes cannot generate that that level of complexity that is functional, specific, information rich, resembling machines, architecture and coding. You said, honestly, as a physicist, I would be willing to say that the physical reality, the physical reality chance of life originating on its own by natural processes within this universe is zero, not just low. I agree. It's because the universe is not infinitely big. There is a finite universe. We don't have an infinite amount of time. The universe has a finite age, roughly 13.8 billion years. That limited time, limited spatial extent of the universe means that there's a, a limited amount that any natural randomness could generate. Now, there's other questions in here about the size of the universe, because some put pushback and say, well, why? There's too much waste, right? Well, mm -hmm. not really. But before you answer that question, can you just uh, unpack what you were saying here? Okay. Um, like you said, this is kind of a whole science course uh, in <laughs> itself. Um, before I get into the topic of information, okay, um, we can kind of stay on the the cosmology side of things for just a minute and uh, addressing that question of um, the size and the age of the universe. And uh, science has fairly convincing evidence, I believe, that the age of the universe is about 13.8 billion years. And it's um, based on the expansion rate of the universe. And um, I would say that you know, that seems like, of course, a long time compared to our lifespans, but really um, that's just because we're so ephemeral. You know, our, I mean, we have short lifespans compared to many things in the universe, like the most common stars in the universe by far are what are called red dwarf stars, smaller mm -hmm. stars than our sun. And their lifespans can extend to hundreds of billions of years, trillion years even. In fact, no red dwarf star in the universe anywhere has ever burned out yet because the universe is too young compared to their lifespan. So for the most common types of stars in the universe, the universe is young. Yes. Okay. It's old compared to how long we'll live, but not everything <laughs> revolves around our perspective and our lifespan. And right. um the other thing is the size of the universe. The size of the universe, you could measure in a couple of different ways. It might be spatial extent. It might be the amount of stuff in the universe, you know, the amount of matter and energy. Either way, the size of the universe is one of the parameters that is extremely finely tuned that needs to be within a very narrow range in order for the universe to exist at all, in order for stars to exist at all, and of course, uh, for life to exist. So I won't go into all the detail of that as to why there's fine tuning, but essentially the universe needs to be given the laws of physics that God put into it as old as it is and as large as it is in order for us to exist. And I know that some uh, who are believers will just feel really um, almost threatened by what I'm saying because they would say, well, I thought that God just created the universe with a snap of his fingers or with a spoken word. And that just happened, you know, in the recent past, maybe six to 10,000 years ago. So anybody, anytime anybody speaks of billions of years, that can seem like a sellout to the devil or some sort of a, a threatening comment that uh, implies that Darwin was right and evolution is true and everything is random and, and there is no God. And I, did, I don't mean to imply that at all. I right. fully believe in God as creator. All I'm saying is that I believe the scientific evidence that we gain from studying the universe 
points to the means by which God made the universe. I believe he and set it into motion, if you will. He kind of spoke the word and said, let it be, and it began, but it began to unfold according to all of the rich design, the orchestrated um, fine tuning that he put within the beginning of the universe. And it is still unfolding. The universe is still um, changing. Stars burn out every day. Stars are formed every day. This process is ongoing. It's just like people are born every day. It's, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that God is not the creator. Mm -hmm. It's just that we do see an ongoing process. And and yet the universe is finite. And that brings it into the next point. If you'd like me to, I could kind of shift over into this information uh, theory uh, sure. topic a little bit here. Yes. I make the uh, point in the second paragraph in this quote that because the universe is finite in both age and extent, you know, the number of particles in the universe is, is not infinite even mm -hmm. though there's a lot, you know, how many atoms are there in even a, a handful of uh, dirt? Well, it's, it's countless it's from our per perspective. We could make an estimate from science, but uh, how many stars are there? Mm -hmm. And um, again, a large number, maybe 10 to the 23 stars, but certainly not infinite. Mm -hmm. And there's not an infinite amount of time. So that means that, um, and I can borrow a, a, a term from um, friends at the Discovery Institute, Stephen Meyer, for example, yeah. um, William Dembski, discussing what are known as the statistical resources of the universe, that due to the limited amount of time and matter in the universe, and also the laws of physics that only allow events to take place at a certain uh, frequency, that there is a kind of a minimum low probability that could ever occur within the universe. And the number comes out to be anything less probable than about one chance in 10 to the 140th just is not going to happen in our yeah. universe. <laughs> and you can compare that with the probability of forming one large protein molecule, which is just one tiny part of say a living cell and the probability of forming one large protein molecule is trillions and trillions of times less probable than the least probable event that could statistically occur within this universe <laughs> and then you know forming one protein is nothing compared to everything that needs to be formed to have a living system even a single celled organism right. and so that's why I would say, as I did in this interview that's quoted here, that the chance of forming life in this universe by just uh, random processes is actually zero. It is mm. not some low probability that, oh, we just got lucky and, you know, freaky low chances happen. No, it's just impossible within this universe, given the laws of physics and given the parameters of the limited time and resources in terms of numbers mm -hmm. of particles. So, ah. you know, that's that's just, um, again, a, a brief boiled down summary of a big topic. And I may have uh, run too fast for some people or even left some things out for others who are experts in the field, but uh, maybe that's well, enough said. No, that, that is hugely helpful. Um, I, you know, there's so much I want to say and ask. All right. Well, let's return to this, um, to carbon for a second. Okay. Uh, one more thing that you said, and I want to talk about. So let me remove this. So carbon infuses helium in stellar cores by a remarkable process. Three helium nuclei that you talked about have to randomly collide almost simultaneously to fuse into a single carbon nucleus. Now, with carbon, with, with really every other element outside of hydrogen or helium, I, I think so, some people, you're going to have to make a decision that either the u universe, because even when we talk about natural selection and, and those types of things, who, 
who's selecting. I know there's not a who, but the way things are, the way things have turned out, the way species are, it seems that as I think Hoyle said, um, a super intellect has monkeyed around with the, you know, with the physics or with the biology or with everything, mm -hmm. because it's not just the fact that somehow we got carbon and somehow we got um, oxygen. It's that we got these things and got them in the, in the precise quantities that are necessary, especially with oxygen. Um, I remember reading Lee Strobel's book and he was doing some research about the science that if you took all the um, carbons and the carbon atoms in the universe, so you are, you're, you're starting with carbon and allowed them to, to react at the most rapid rate possible for and left it, just let it do its own thing for, for hundreds, thousands, millions of years. The chances of creating one functional protein molecule is one in 10 to the 60th. Um, that. That's not just mind boggling. I think it's like you said, it's not just low, it's zero. <laughs> the chances the chances of that happening, because even mm -hmm. if the universe lucked up and did it one time, it's not taking notes on itself. It doesn't know how to repeat the process. I know James mm -hmm. Tour talks a lot about, we have the technology of today and we still can't go in the lab, we scientists and create you know, uh, cells from scratch, um, abiogenesis and stuff of that nature. So. If all of, if if scientists such as yourself, brilliant people are are with all your brain power trying to recreate what we are claiming the universe did accidentally and can't do it, doesn't that seem to say, well, maybe it wasn't accidentally, maybe it's not as random as you think, uh, maybe there was there was something guiding this. Mm -hmm. Well, I would agree that uh, current origin of life researchers are actually helping to prove the point that uh, life must have been intelligently designed because the most intelligent researchers on planet earth have not gotten anywhere close to being right. able to do it and right. so to just sort of you know punt and say oh well it it happened randomly you know we can't do it with all of our our lab technology and and phds and and uh, understanding, but, you know, just uh, sort of shaking things together, that'll work, uh, given enough time. But as I've shown, the uh, complexity of the simplest parts of a living cell is so great that all the time in the universe and all the particles in the universe, you know, take all those carbons or um, if you could somehow put them all together in one place and allow them to interact for the entire history of the universe, you would not even come close to producing the ingredients that we find within a single cell. Wow. Wow. It's a mouthful there. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the sun. Obviously, um, all of us are big fans of the sun, even as you mentioned, you know, us in, in, in Chicago, we're not seeing a lot of it right now, but that's okay. I know it's there. <laughs> yeah. um, but obviously the sun is is the key. You know, we, we understand that we're in a, in a ge um, uh, not a geocentric, um, <laughs> uh, the opposite of a geocentric um, universe. And so the sun being our center and, and even how orbits work, but you, very simple sentence you wrote on page 96, sunshine is thus an amazing thing. And you were talking about prior to that, why even the sun itself is, is an amazing thing. Um, the strong nuclear force, the weak nuclear force, the stellar furnace, I think you called it. Can you kind of unpack um, why is the sun so amazing and how is its design uh, not just producing or allowing life on earth, but even how does the, how does how does it equate to the uh, the orbits? The the part where you talked about the moon uh, doesn't rotate, so there's only one side that faces Earth, right? right? And you said Earth could have been like that towards the sun, and then one side of Earth would have been just all cold all the time. Yes, but it's not. And so, can you kind of unpack all how this happened, or why, or what happened? <laughs> yes, this is a. a prime beautiful example for example just understanding the orbit of the earth around the sun and its placement it's a prime example of of fine-tuning 
of design because, um, for example, we have, say, nine planets in the solar system, if you want to still count Pluto, and um, <laughs> none of the other ones are anywhere close to being a uh, suitable um, surrogate for Earth. You know, if, if we needed to go somewhere else and live, uh, we're out of luck. They're... So one of the things that... Right, I'm sorry to cut you off. Is there, should we all just stop trying to get to Mars? <laughs> oh, no, I am all in favor of uh, okay. <laughs> interplanetary explanation. If for no other reason than just it's interesting, it's yeah. exciting to see what's out there. Um, you know, but if we're going to live on Mars, it's going to have to be within a uh, something like a space station, uh, you know, on the ground, uh, total artificial life support. Mm. Um, I mean, just the ultraviolet light intensity reaching the surface of Mars due to its low density atmosphere, 100 times less uh, air pressure than on Earth, it would make it so that you know, ultraviolet light would, would kill any living thing on, on the surface of Mars. And um, so it's an interesting place. Who knows what we'll find just studying its geological history and maybe trying to understand why is Mars so desolate now and what happened in its history that uh, maybe evaporated all of, it, all of its water? Because um, scientists do believe that maybe it had water earlier on, which is fascinating. But um, So our placement in orbit around the sun is key for our survivability on planet Earth because we need liquid water. Uh, you know, we can tolerate a little swing in temperature from summer to winter, but if those uh, temperature extremes became too great, we're either going to freeze to death or we're going to, uh, you know, bake, or bake alive. And, um, you know, I look at the uh, farm fields in Indiana and they're just frozen wastelands. And I, I thought to myself, what if the temperature never got above freezing again? You know, we can go weeks and weeks and not get above freezing in the wintertime. But what if it never got above freezing? Well, nothing would ever grow that, uh, you know, could support all the life on, on Earth. And um, so the distance of our planet from the sun is a key factor in determining the amount of heat we receive and in determining, you know, that we could have, say, liquid water um, on the surface of the Earth, which is often regarded as a essential ingredient for life of any kind. And uh, no other planet um, lies in just the right position for that uh, set of conditions to exist within our solar system. It's called the, um, the habitable zone, the circumstellar habitable zone. And we're, we're in it in just the right place. Now, you mentioned about our moon and how one face of the moon always is turned towards the Earth. So we've got the face that we see, and then there's the other side that no one ever saw until space probes went into orbit around the moon and took a picture of the backside. And, um, well, it's kind of like the front, except it's even more cratered and a uh, um, little different thickness of the crust on that side and so on. But if Earth orbited as close to the Earth or close to the sun as Venus does or Mercury, the two planets that are closer in to the sun than the Earth, then we would have gotten into a condition known as tidal locking where the tidal effect of the sun's gravity on Earth would have eventually caused the Earth to have one face always towards the sun mm. and the other always towards the cold of outer space. One side would be utterly baked and the other side utterly frozen. And, um, or it might change very slowly, say over the period of a whole year, you might go from hot to cold, but in any, of those options, such as are found on Mercury and Venus, uh, life would be essentially impossible on Earth. Uh, certainly, as we know it, it would not exist. So that has to do with the fact that our sun is bright enough, that we can be far enough away, that we don't suffer that tidal locking. Um, and um, you might think, well, perhaps a larger star would work just as well. It would put out more heat and we could be further away and not suffer that tidal locking, and we'd still be comfortable in terms of the amount of heat if we are far enough away. But larger stars have a major problem in that they have shorter lifespans. 
In mm. fact, if the sun were only 40% more massive than it is, just 40% more massive than it is, it would already be a dead star. And its uh, main sequence lifespan would already be over, and uh, so would life on Earth. So a more massive star would not work well. They are more dangerous in their ultraviolet radiation output as well. A less massive star would not be suitable because we would have to order orbit closer in order to uh, get enough warmth, and that would lead to this tidal locking, which would be disastrous for our climate. So really, we've got the right mass of a star, and we've, we're orbiting at just the right distance to make life possible. So uh, that, that's sort of the, the physical environment. I didn't address the interior uh, marvels of the sun, but you know, it's just an example of how everything we study just shows itself to be marvelously designed to support yeah. life. Well, that was like actually going to be a follow-up question because I remember you were talking about the interior sun, but also acknowledging that no one has obviously been inside the sun or seen inside, but oh. there's ways you guys have of, of figuring out what's going on. Sure. But it's almost that, that there's something of a factory, or that that's the image I had in my head of what's inside the sun and what's going on and what's being kicked out as far as uh, even some of the, the materials and elements that have um, been created. Can you talk about what's in the sun a little bit? Well, I, I used to, uh, you know, when I taught astronomy at Ball State, I would tell my students the, the sun is getting ready to throw a party. <laughs> and, you know, if you have a party, you're going to probably get some helium balloons uh, from the store and uh, bring them home, put them in the house. And uh, the sun is producing helium. That's the uh, byproduct of the fusion reaction that produces the energy of our sun, where it's converting hydrogen to helium. Mm -hmm. um, that's pretty much all that's going on there right now. It's fascinating for a couple of reasons. In the process of producing helium, you start with four hydrogens, which are four protons, but you get one helium, which is not four protons stuck together, but two protons and two neutrons stuck together in the nucleus. Hmm. So I found it, you know, it's just fascinating to talk about that along the way in the fusion process, two of the protons convert to neutrons. And that's one of the um, processes that can happen. It's governed by the so-called weak force, one of the four fundamental forces of nature that kind of governs that uh, type of um, particle uh, transformation process. And again, if the weak force wasn't um, present or didn't have its particular value of strength that it did, uh, that would affect this whole fusion process, and we probably wouldn't be here to talk about it. Probably not. <laughs> no. So another um, oh, go ahead. for everybody, this the weak nuclear force is what, and the strong nuclear force is what. Okay, there are four fundamental forces of nature, and, and two of them are these nuclear forces. The strong nuclear force is what holds the nucleus together, and you need a strong force because the nucleus of every element besides hydrogen contains more than one proton. Protons are positively charged and they're packed together in the nucleus. And you may know from science that like charges repel. Mm -hmm. So these protons all repel each other very, very vigorously, strongly. They don't like to be close together and they won't stay close together unless there was a strong force. And I kind of Think of the strong force like Velcro. Mm. Um, imagine protons that are repelling each other. Um, but if you push them close enough together, the Velcro holds them tight. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of the way it is with the strong force. It's very short range. Things have to basically almost touch before they get stuck together by the strong force. Mm. And... Um, that leads to the conditions inside the star. It has to be hot so the particles are moving fast and that they have enough energy so when they are on a head-on collision, they get close enough to mm -hmm. let this Velcro-like strong force stick them together. That's called fusion. And um, so another part of this fusion process is that in the conversion of the proton to a neutron, 
when you're making helium out of hydrogen, mm -hmm. every time you convert a proton to a neutron, it not only makes that, but it also produces what's known as a positron, which is a little positive particle. And it's actually antimatter. And so it's fascinating, but the sun is continuously producing antimatter, anti-electrons. And part of the sunlight that we get to enjoy here on Earth comes from the so-called matter-antimatter annihilation process down in the core of the sun, where those anti-electrons combine with normal electrons and mutually annihilate each other in a burst of gamma rays and um, that gets converted into part of the sunlight that we uh, are so thankful for on a winter day. <laughs> and um, there's there are other processes. The uh, uh, how much do I go into here? You know, it's uh, well, I, I mean, that, uh, <laughs> not everybody has a high tolerance level for physics. <laughs> well, let me ask this then. We know what the strong nuclear force does now. Where did it come from? Is it a oh. necessary condition to the universe, in, in other words? Oh, it's extremely necessary for there to be anything interesting in the universe in terms of other atoms. Any atom besides hydrogen, which is the simplest atom that has mm -hmm. only one proton in the nucleus, every other atom that you can name requires the strong force right. to exist. So I guess what I'm asking is, is there anything inherent in the universe if we're just saying on an atheistic side that necessitates the strong nuclear force in order for there to be a universe, not, not since we know that it's necessary to, in order to have carbon, you need it or anything other than hydrogen, like you said, but is there, there, was there anything in the big bang that would necessitate or precipitate a strong nuclear force having to be, or is that something that, as a theist, I say that makes perfect sense. That's how God did it. But I don't know from a random occurrence, why would a randomness with no mind have the idea to have a strong nuclear force? Does that make sense? Yes. Oh, I, th I think it does. And um, it's asking one of those questions that even for a, uh, you know, a particle physicist or nuclear physicist would be a question they would love to have an answer for, you know, did the strong force have to be the way it is or why is it the way it is? Mm -hmm. And um, we don't exactly have an answer for that. Um, it's part of what we would say about the universe that it's, um, it seems to be contingent. There are aspects of the universe, parameters, physical uh, properties that are just the way they are and you could not have predicted them by any sort of a philosophical uh, necessity. Um, and so I think it shows that there, again, is a, a mind behind the universe that made choices mm. that brought these various features of the universe into existence on purpose so that we could exist. I mean, that's, that's kind of my theistic um, spin on that. Yeah. And, you know, there is an effort underway among scientists around the world to try to explain away any of that um, with a theory of everything. You may have heard of that. So like one theory that's going to explain why there's a strong force and a gravity and, and everything else. And, and yet if that succeeds, which it might, I don't know, but if it <laughs> does, it just is not going to eliminate the argument for God. It's going to simply bring it back a level and uh, maybe even make it more interesting. And we would ask, why is this uh, theory of everything exactly the way it is so that the universe exists in a way that it can support intelligent human life? Uh, yeah, I think, you know, well, we'll see what happens with the theory of everything. I would say it's already been done. Uh, God did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's got that one in his back yeah. pocket. I, I'm not sure that we fully understand it yet. but <laughs> because, because the theory of everything, and this is where I think some scientists, especially those who are more aggressive, like the Dawkins of the world, who even some of his atheistic contemporaries will acknowledge, he's good in, in his own lane, but he's a terrible philosopher. Like mm -hmm. once you start making assertions 
Some people think that they're making scientific statements. You're not. You're making metaphysical, philosophical statements, which means you've already exited naturalism. That's another story. But okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think that there's a um, uh, there's an assumption that more well, by some people um, who are, are are of the more militant variety that um, everything for them will encompass everything. I, I guess that's the best way to say it. It's the same thing when we say something can't come from nothing. And then the atheist scientists will say this or that. I've heard Neil deGrasse T Tyson, brilliant man. And he, and he was asked a question and he kept giving possible explanations for what started everything. And in my head, I'm screaming at the TV because I'm like, that's something. Those are things. That's not mm -hmm. nothing. <laughs> and, yeah. and, and it seems, you know, maybe you you run into this that something always gets smuggled in to the nothing mm -hmm. right? because because the same the same reason abiogenesis and trying to create cells in a lab is not working so far is because i think scientists are realizing we need something to work with or work from is that is that a fair way to say it yes and you know there's sort of two i guess uh focus points for that one would be how do you get the universe and uh, someone who doesn't believe in God always needs to have something there before the universe, something yeah. that gave rise to the universe, even right. if they call it just a quantum field or, you know, something uh, kind of uh, vague like that. Mm -hmm. But of course that's something. And then where did that come from? Right. Or you could go to the same thing with uh, attempts to create life and, um, it's basic uh, biology that a living cell is always preceded by another living cell. Mm. There's, there's no example anywhere in biology of a living cell coming from anything other than a precursor cell. Yeah, it makes sense. And, and so, you know, how far back can that go? Well, where did the first cell come from? And that's where, you know, the argument goes that, well, okay, we've got random mixes of chemicals in a pond and you had something called chemical evolution which um is um going to run into the issues with these uh kind of limitations on statistical possibilities within our finite universe amen well just a couple more um, um quotes from your book and and listen i encourage everyone if you haven't already uh, please go get the book canceled science there's you know we're only scratching the surface, I promise you, uh, of, of the knowledge that's, that's in the book, but also of um, what Dr. Hedin has in himself. So only a little bit here tonight. Um, okay. On page 187, let's see here. He said that uh, if nat, I love this, if naturalism is scientism's mother, the success of the scientific enterprise is scientism's father. It's a great, it's a great quote. Like, can you unpack that for us? Sure. Probably we should start with a definition of scientism <laughs> um, in case people aren't quite familiar with that, but it's the extreme um, view of science as the mother of everything, that there is no other source of knowledge besides science. And there is, Obviously, in that view of scientism, no such thing as God or anything supernatural or metaphysical. It's all just um, nature, and, um, and then science can explain it all. So naturalism, again, might be this, this view that, okay, the universe is closed. There's, there's no outside of the universe. It's just a, a physical realm. Even if you hypothesize a multiverse, that's just sort of, again, part of the universe. There's no um, celestial realm of, of God, let's say. That would be naturalism. There's, there's nothing besides the forces of nature. Um, now, the point that the success of the scientific enterprise is scientism's father, I think that that has um, come about more and more as time has gone on, that people in general are aware that uh, technology is improving and increasing and and it seems like you know we're having success with 
just sort of manipulating nature and understanding it and new discoveries and so on. And this is the success of the scientific enterprise. And so some people will take the success we've had and extrapolate it to the ind indefinite future and say, there is no limit to the scientific enterprise. However, I feel that that is an argument based on kind of wishful thinking and actually ignorance of nature. Because as a physicist, we know that nature is limited. Again, it's limited in how old the universe is. It's limited in what nature is. There's only four fundamental forces of nature. And, and they mostly just are a push or a pull. You know, gravity pulls stuff together. The electric force can push or pull uh, charged particles, but that's it. And those right. are the forces of nature. There are no other forces of nature besides those push pull things. And to assume that a combination of pushing and pulling can um, do anything like create you and me, uh, create an intelligent mind, a rational being that can make free will choices. I mean, that's going so far beyond what we know nature can do that it actually has left the realm of science. And um, scientism also suffers from this problem that, again, it insists that there is nothing in the universe besides these push-pull forces of nature acting on atoms. So that means that our brains, with which we think, are simply made up of random uh, assemblies of atoms that are pushing and pulling on each other. And so how can you trust such a uh, origin of such a brain or its operation to produce anything like a rational thought. Yeah. And it's, so it even kind of is a self-defeating theory. Scientism right. proposes that our brains are based on random forces of nature acting on matter. And so therefore, why should we believe anything that our brains say, including the thought that scientism is the correct theory? Exactly. So it's a a closed loop that actually circles the drain and uh, pretty soon you don't even have a, a thought. G.K. Chesterton called this idea the thought that stops thought. <laughs> he decried it as a very yeah. dangerous idea because it's ridiculously unproductive. Yeah. You know, I, I've, uh, <laughs> that's, I love that. I've, I've said before, uh, I say often actually, um, it's not that I think, atheism or naturalism, I guess more specifically, um, doesn't have good answers, it's that they can't even justify asking the questions. <laughs> that's uh, <laughs> I was, uh, that's I was, a good point. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, um, I'm learning, I'm learning. So I, I was actually speaking for a Reasons to Believe chapter, um, you know, uh, Hugh Ross's organization, mm -hmm. on what does it mean to be human? And you know, part of it, I, like I said, I was actually unpacking the information in DNA and what DNA is. It's at the highest level of information, which is called alphabetics. And just just unpacking the idea that that level of information never in our lives or in our in our worldview or in our paradigms comes from anything other than a mind. Every every time if you're walking on the beach, no one's there. I see I love Jane written in the sand. I intuitively know a person did that. I don't have to see a person. Right. Likewise, when I look at the universe, when you look at the universe, I should say, you're saying, I see all these messages written as though someone's writing them to me, you know, in, in a way that mm -hmm. you guys, physicists, you get to look at stuff that most of us would never get to see and 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 see the intricacies and see not just the intricacies, but the specificity. You talk mm -hmm. about the element, the cell. It's not just that the cell is is precise; the components of the cell are so precise. Exactly. Themselves, it, it's just mind-boggling. And on a molecular on a molecular level of molecules, I don't I don't know what's quarks, I guess. Um, so I don't know. I think it's 
for me, I look at it as we're reasoning, looking at the pile of evidence on the table, almost like Lee Strobel looked at that wall in the movie. It was like, you know, it takes more faith not to believe than to believe. Um, mm. And I think we're, we're well with warrant to believe at that point. So last one, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll go over it. You said such belief is not inevitable. And this is in reference, <clears throat> excuse me, this is um, in regards to the regularity of the universe, you wrote, um, such belief is not inevitable. Um, it has not been shared by all cultures. In other words, all cultures didn't believe that there was this regularity that we just know was there. Mm -hmm. and, um, we can assume, and, and it's not been shared by all cultures. It's important to see Planiga as Alvin Planiga, that our notion of the laws of nature, crucial for contemporary science, uh, has the has this origin in Christian theism. And so I talked a little bit about the at the beginning. You put it in your book from from, from Newton to Boyle to Maxwell to uh, you know run down the list. I had a, I have a list somewhere of like thirty mm -hmm. different <laughs> prominent scientists. So you're so now at this point, and and I did this question last because I wanted to build the case for those watching who may not agree. It's not just that. I'm a Christian and I'm trying to fit evidence into my worldview. It's the world makes, it's like C.S. Lewis said, I, I don't believe in Christianity because um, by it, I see, no, he said, because by it, I see everything else. It's not because I see, it's by it, I see everything else. In other words, what helps me make a coherent picture of the world is an understanding that there's a designer behind it. That actually helps me, right? Mm -hmm. it, it, what I'm gathering from your quote that, Yes. If we start from this point of view, and I'm not a presuppositionalist, but if you were and you start from that point from, OK, there's a designer. Now, when we're looking for design, it makes sense. Yes. Whereas Dawkins has to say, because he's committed to his worldview, it has the appearance of design. Well, sometimes things are as they appear. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so what did you mean when you wrote this? I believe that the point actually kind of uh, goes back into history. And you mentioned uh, a number of scientists uh, that are essential that we still teach today. You know, I'm teaching first year physics and we, we've already talked about Isaac Newton and we're talking about Maxwell this semester. And um, these were scientists who believed in the existence of a creator and particularly the God of the Bible and why that would be helpful for kind of helping to develop science is, is this. If you're going to explore the natural world and try to understand it, you have to believe that it's understandable, that it's possible to comprehend it. And as those who believe in God, Christians who have read the Bible, we understand that God created the universe for a purpose. And part of that purpose was for us to live in it and to be able to see it and to give glory back to God as we look at nature. So we believe that God made the universe understandable. And also we understand a little bit about the creator. He's a God who is rational and reasonable. And so we expect that we can use our reason and rational thought to appreciate what he has made based on this thought that if God created the universe and he is this way, then the universe should be reflective of the creator. And also in the Bible, in particular, the Christian religion, God is separate from nature. And that's a key point. He's, it's not a pantheistic idea that somehow God is, you know, if, if you look under a rock, you're actually, you know, investigating God, or if you, do an experiment, you're, you're poking at God's midsection. You know, God is separate from nature. And so it gives us permission then to study nature without thinking somehow that we're dissecting the deity. Mm. And I think that that's a, a key thought that distinguishes Christianity from some other religions. Um, now, some might say, well, isn't it just easier to leave God out of the picture altogether? like an atheist might claim that. But if you think about that, why should this universe be comprehensible then? Why should your brain be able to understand 
quantum mechanics or nuclear physics that has nothing to do with the survival of the fittest that according to evolutionary theory, our brains were developed based on that whole notion of survival of the fittest mm -hmm. and uh, meaning basically trying to procreate the most. And right. if that's the only kind of motivation or rationale for our development, then why should we be able to understand higher mathematics or, or develop beautiful art or understand philosophy? which would have nothing to do with that type of a history. But if we're made in the image of God, if we're children of God, who is rational, who is moral, um, who is creative, loves beauty, as we see in the Bible, then it makes sense that the universe could be understood by us, could be appreciated by us. And I, I just want to say to someone like, you know, Jerry Coyne, you don't lose anything by deciding to believe in God. I, there's so much ability yeah. to offer worship and praise and thanks for the wonders of what we see, both in the living world and in the, you know, of, of biology, and, as well as in the physical world. And, you know, that the, the God of the Bible, that Jesus Christ shows himself to be loving towards us. And I really, you know, just like, who wouldn't love a God that would be willing to die for you? And that's, that's Jesus Christ. That's the God that I serve. And, you know, he forgives us when we fail and teaches us to forgive. And I do sp speak that out as well. Um, and we started this talk about those who sort of attacked me at Ball State and got my course canceled. I want to say that, you know, I don't hold any ill will. Um, and I, in, as a follower of Christ, I extend forgiveness and blessing in the name of Jesus over those who maybe in their own worldview thought they were doing the right thing. But, um, you know, I don't believe that uh, their worldview is correct if they leave God out of it. But um, I will speak out that uh, blessing and pray for God's grace and peace to be in their lives. Amen. Well, that is a great place to leave it. And um, I really appreciate you saying, I appreciate your time. I appreciate um, your heart behind what you do. Um, yeah, keep doing what you do. And and um, I'm sorry for the situation, but I'm also glad of what it produced, not, not to mention the book itself, because now I have access, we have access to uh, those things that you were pointing out. And actually, I'll just say this, you did this several times in the book, but that point to me is one of the most important, least thought about most important points. And I'm a, I'm a philosophy nerd, so this might not be cool with everybody else. But that point is so important because uh, I was considering PhD work and I still might, but it, it's it's going to have a, um, it's going to be a, addressing the mind body debate, uh, mind brain debate, I should say. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I believe I have a, a window into what could make for good um, PhD you know, dissertation, but mm -hmm. But the but the part that you said that I didn't really consider is because I considered the the lack of follow through if the modus operandi is survival of the fittest. If that's the case, then everything should operate that way. And obviously, we humans don't. Most of us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but the point that you just made is so unique because unless we're here for a reason, unless there's a purpose, there are so many, most things we do on a day-to-day -day basis probably have nothing to do really with survival outside of eating. Um, yes. You know, a lot like this, what we, me and you are doing right now, this has nothing to do with you living or me living. Yeah. Um, and then the preparation that I did for this, the thinking that I did. So none of those things have anything to do with, my being able to live or survive, or if the only goal of life is to survive, then they had nothing to do with enjoying life. Yet, I'm compelled to do these things. I'm compelled to think in these different ways where people are compelled to invent and create and write and no other species has that capacity or that desire. And I've talked before about human exceptionalism, and I know that's a sticky topic for some, but it just... I'm just looking at the evidence and I'm like, well, what other conclusion can one come to? We're clearly exceptional. <laughs> yes. I, 
I mean, if you even just look at a, a newborn yeah. child, um, it's just an amazing miracle. I mean, I don't know how anybody could uh, really contemplate another human being and, and not reach the conclusion that there's, there is something uh, marvelous in this creation of God. Amen. Amen. Well, let's leave it there. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you to everybody who joined in. And, and Very welcome. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And uh, for everyone else, you know, tune in next week. We'll be back. Uh, until next time. Yeah.